Hello, everybody. Um, I would like to start by describing a little bit the context of uh, what happened in 1933. And I must say that 1933 in Germany was a very, very bad year, especially for German liberals and more so for German Jews. It was a horrible year. It was the start of the disaster in a way. Adolf Hitler, the head of the Nazi party in Germany, became after, I must say, a democratic, legitimate elections process, the chancellor or the head of the state of Germany in, on January 30. And within weeks, really within weeks, it happened so quickly, Germany became a totalitarian dictatorship. A new, German laws forced Jews to, they forced them out of their civil service jobs, out of the university, out of public service, like uh, German Jewish doctor had to leave the hospitals. And it's, it's formidable to see it happening within, within weeks or within months. Jews became second class citizens. Uh, now, on April 8, a few, two months after the, Hitler came to power, the main office for press and propaganda of the German Student Union proclaimed them a, a national-wide action against the un-German, and try to understand what un-German means, un-German spirit which was to climax in a literary purge by fire and in a moment we will see it. Uh, let's see the next one. The Nazi book burning was indeed a campaign conducted by the students, as said, uh, to ceremonially burn books, which seems to be very, very, very bizarre. Uh, they burned book or intended to burn books that were found subversive or opposed to a Nazi ideology. They had a blacklist and in the blacklist they had many, many names of writers, of authors. Most of them were Jews, but not only. I would say that 2% of them were Jewish, but all of them were liberal, pacifist, um, in a way, uh, favoriting the left. The initial books tar targeted were, for example, books by Heinrich Heine, of course, by Albert Einstein, think of the names, by Stefan Zweig, by Sigmund Freud, by Erich Kessner, by Franz Kafka, who emerged on the literary scene not, not many years prior to that, or liberal non-Jewish such as Thomas Mann, his brother Heinrich Mann, or Bertolt Brecht, and many other. What you see in the slide that we are all gathering at is really this ceremony of May 10, 1933. The students burned thousands of books uh, all over Germany in 34 university cities. Here you see the 20,000 books that were burned piled and burned in a bonfire in Berlin, in a square next to the opera. Um, and you can see high Nazi officials there. I said that these were, that it was initiated by the, um, by the students, by the association of students, but it was really a state affair. It was, it was something that was uh, initiated not only by students, but by the state too, the state too, and you can see SA officers and uh, SS officers and professors of the university and rectors of the universities and of course students leaders and everybody is very happy. The gathering was accompanied by music, by singing. It was a very happy evening and uh, 40,000 participants Participants could be could be counted there. Uh, and how think of how awful 
and how monstrous this could be just because these were university people. When we think of university, we think of the places where books are written, not where books are destroyed. And this is the monstrosity of Nazism, exactly. Well, this Fine. is uh, Goebbels, the Minister of Propaganda, maybe the best, uh, the best ally of Adolf Hitler, who accompanied his uh, his deeds and his career until the very day of his of the of the death. I think it was together at the same day in the bunker in Berlin. And Goebbels, uh, who was invited by the students to speak, speaks. Uh, and we have the text of what he said. You can find it in, on YouTube too. It's very <clears throat> interesting to read. The next one, please. Here are the words of Goebbels. And from this, you can understand that the whole campaign was addressed or was initiated in order to uh, attack the Jews. The Jews were the demonial and most important enemy of Germany. Uh, the era of extreme Jewish intellectualism is now at an end. So we are finishing with the Jews and the Jews are intellectuals. And uh, the Jews are, I would say, democratic. The Jews are, are all what the Nazi party is against. And see this, the next sentence, the future German men will not just be a man of books, because to be a man of books is very bad, is very, is very weak, but a man of character, a man of action. And thus said Goebbels, you do well in this midnight hour to commit to the flames, the evil Uh, one before, the end of the sentence. The evil spirit of the past. Judaism, Jewry belongs to a dead world, to a world that is not there anymore. It was the world of the past. And look at the, at the phrasing, which has to do with witchcraft and, and, and uh, Black Sabbath as the evil spirit of the past. And that's connected to Jews, for example. Now, uh, years later, and the next one, the city of Berlin announced a contest uh, to erect on the same spot where the, the books were burned in Berlin, a monument, a memorial to, I wouldn't say to commemorate, but to, to relate to to this event, to this horrible event of the burning of the books. And the person, the one, the artist who won the competition was Micha Ullman, who is here with us, not because he was an Israeli or because he was Jewish, but because his uh, offer or his uh, proposal was really the best. And I can argue for that. See the next one. And Micha Ullmann's uh, work of art called Bibliotech Library, no, not so quickly, was, uh, uh, was created in 95. When you come today, and this is uh, at, at, at evening, to the square where the bonfire of the books took place, you will see uh, a light glowing from the floor of the square. When you approach the next one, you would see people crouching. There's always, there are always people crouching there on a, this light comes through a glass sheet in the square and they look at something. In a moment, we will see what they see. Uh, the one next to this, you see the place, the square during the day, and you see the lady uh, looking down and she looks through a kind of a window, and that's the work by Michael Ullmann, cut in the floor 
of the square, which is one of the main squares in Berlin now, next to the Unter den Linden. Uh, and that's typical of Mira Ullmann to look down at his monuments. And she looks down and in down there, she sees the sky, she, she sees the, whatever she sees. The next one. And that's Micha Ullmann's monument. Again, as we said, it's a opening. It's a window in the sky. You can stand on the glass sheet above that covers the what is there down below. You can guess that these are shelves. In a moment, we will see it more clearly, but you can see shelves. You can see how the man, the person who stands on the glass sheet uh, sees what he sees. You can see the clouds, clouds reflected in the, in the glass. And the next one, That's how you see it without the clouds reflected. And what you see here are shelves. And these shelves are empty shelves. It could be, if you, there would be something on them, for example, books, it could be a library, a subterranean library, but it's completely empty. Uh, it looks like uh, some big aspirator sucked out the everything, the books, the colors, uh, Nothing is left, it's a void. It's a void and when you stand on it, it's quite frightening because what you feel is standing or almost falling into an abyss. And you can think of all these symbolic uh, ideas and, see, and, and existential feelings you, you, can, uh, you can feel when you stand on this frightening, frightening uh, quite seemingly seen, thin, uh, sheet of glass. It looks dangerous. Uh, on the shelves, you could put easily the 20,000 books that were burned on May 10th, 1933. And it's a wonderful work of art. So such an intelligent work of art because you, you can hardly see it. You look at it only when you stand on it or at night when you see the glow coming from from, uh, from beneath. Um, and you can feel, you can sense the, the, the void. It's, it became a very known, famous work of art. I think that it uh, exists or it's mentioned in all the tourist guides of Berlin as one highlight you must see. And uh, I think that it's a very, very important uh, work of art. Uh, the National Library of Israel, in, in a moment we get to it, thought too that this is the most important work of art that should be dealt with when the new building of the library is going to be erected. Now let's see the next slide and what you see there. That, that, that's not before that, that's, that's an example of how uh, in the winter day you could see again the shelves, the clouds, and you have the feeling of smoke and fire there, um, uh, which is again very, very, very symbolic because indeed what happened there in Berlin is that the language was burned. And that's what we are talking about. And the work of art of Mira Ullmann is embodying this uh, frightening concept and feeling. Uh, I'm reminding, reminding you that uh, some hundred years prior to that, Heinrich Heine in one of his plays mentioned after another uh, book burning in Munich or in Leipzig, he mentioned, he wrote 
where they burned books, they will one day burn people as well. And it was prophetic and it really happened during the Holocaust. Now, coming back to Jerusalem, to modern Jerusalem, please, Tadeusz. Yeah, you see that uh, birds view of a lot in Jerusalem. Uh, you can see, if I'm used, did you, you, you see my marker? Tadeusz, do you see my marker? No, no, unfortunately, no. Mm. Because in the middle, there is an empty, empty lot where the National Library, the new National Library of Israel building uh, is now standing. But then when we, when the, this photograph was taken, it wasn't yet there. Yeah, it's exactly what uh, Tadeusz is pointing with his marker. And the, one day the chairman of the board of the National Library invited Micha, who he knew very well from prior to that. They stood both on this empty ground and uh, Mr. Bloomberg, the chairman said, uh, Micha, uh, in a few years here will stand the new building of the Library of Israel and we, the board of the govern or, or the, the board of governors of the library want you to erect a work of art sculpture uh, that um, will symbolize a kind of a Jerusalemite response to the empty, cold, and uh, neon littered library in Berlin. If the library in Berlin commemorates or, or speaks or shows the burning of the language and the new National Library of Israel will be the, the home of language, the home of books, we want that your work of art will, will in a way be the expression of that kind of concept. Now, let's see the next slide. And you will see that's that's a sign. Uh, Tadeusz, can you, can you enlarge the photograph so that we can see? Uh, okay, never mind. No, don't don't bother. It's okay. Never mind. What you, what you see here is the new uh, National Library already there in the middle on the spot that we showed you empty before. You see it's uh, this prime uh, surrounding. For on the left is the Knesset, the Parliament of Israel. Down below is the Israel Museum, the National Museum of Israel with the Shrine of the Book, which is also the part of there, a very important uh, historical modern, modern historical modern. And on the left is the University of uh, Jerusalem. Far away, you can't discern it, but it's a high court of Jerusalem. It's the high court of Israel. So uh, you, you can understand the the charisma of the place where the National Library is. And you can see that in front of the National Library, at the corner of the lot that we showed you before, here, the round um, kind of plaza. Are you able to show it, Tadeusz, in front of the library there, at the corner of the lot, to the right a little bit? Yeah, the round one. That's, that's, that's the work of art that we are going to discuss in a minute, created by Micha Ulman. It's called Letters of Life. We will see in a moment why. Uh, let's see the next one. You see a model created by Micha Ulman of the of the piece, and you see that, that it has an upper ground part with a circle of 
we will understand in a moment that these are stone letters. And down below, we see an opening, and that's an opening to which, which leads you to the underground dimension of the sculpture. We have two, two chapters in the, in the work of art. Like, we, like you would have a possible view into the, the roots of the forest from the entrance down below. Now the next one, and we get closer to the, that's a model, that's a working model uh, Michael Ullmann did from the beginning of his work. That was the model that served him to, to ponder on the work, to work with it, to change, to play with the lights around, um, to make it living. It's, uh, it's quite a big, uh, quite a big machine uh, standing, I think, even now in his studio. And we would meet there a lot of times. Uh, people who discussed the sculpture when they met Micha Ullmann, spoke about it and looked at the, at the model. And from the model, you, under, you can understand that these are um, letters. That's why it's called letters of light. Uh, but you don't really see the letters. What you see is the shadow of the letters on the floor of the square. What you see are the openings in the stone, and we will see it, you will understand it in one or two moments when we, when we get closer, closer views. Uh, but you can understand that we are talking of language. We are talking of, of, of letters, of a circle of letters. Now, in the middle of the square, you see three letters cut in the ground. But these are not different letters. It's one letter. It's a letter A in three languages. It has the Aleph in Hebrew. It has the Alpha in Latin. And it has the Alif in Arabic. And you should take into account that all these Hebrew, Arabic, and Latin are all the language, la languages that you would meet on the shelves and in the storerooms of the library itself that stands not far from there. So this is a kind of material metaphor of the library of Israel. And let's see the next one. And so, uh, before, before you go, you continue, uh, I want to emphasize the fact again that I said before, and I will come back to it again, but it's very important to note that what is important here is the way the light goes through the uh, openings in the letters in the stone and mark with their shadows the floor. So uh, let's continue. And here you see the actual sculpture in the making. It's not finished yet. It's there, the, the letters, the stone letters are there. The letters come from the Negev, from Mitzpe Ramon. Uh, Micha took a lot of time to, to chew them uh, in many curries all over Israel. Uh, you see in the middle that the three letters A are not yet opened there. Uh, and uh, you can see better the uh, openings in these stones. Uh, for example, uh, Tadeusz, can you show here the, the yud? It's close to us. Exactly. No? To the right a little bit? Yeah, that's, that's the letter yud. And so you could understand the principle of what, what Michal Ullmann is doing. The yud is carved in the stone. It's an opening. It's a hole. And Michal Ullmann is an artist who works a lot with this concept of negative space of something there that you can uh, finish in your imagination, but it doesn't exist there. Uh, the, the sculpture in Berlin is also a sculpture about emptiness. It's a void, it's a pit, an empty pit. Uh, uh, one, one more. 
And now just in order to understand uh, what we mean by the very concept of a letter. What is a letter? We have here two Hebrew letters, the M and the Y. To get to, to, to together, they are me. Me, the beginning of Micha. The Yud at the end uh, is the start of my name, of Igal. Uh, but what does it mean to have this sign that uh, represents a letter? It means something very simple. It's an order. It's an instruction. It's a physical instruction to the body. When you see the letter Yud, you should uh, blow an amount of air from your, lung, from your lungs to, the, to your mouth, to a specific place in your mouth. In mouth. It could be your teeth, it could be your tongue, it could be uh, your gutter. And uh, this makes the noise or the sound of a letter. When I see the yud, I know that I, I should use my lungs and say and pronounce the yud. And that's the very, very, it seems, it seems to be very, very, very simple, but it's one of the most genial uh, ideas, the most genial inventions of human civilization. Because before, that's, this, that's the come out of the invention of alphabet. Before that, you would use thousands of letters in order to say something very simple, like in the Egyptian antique, antique, antique alphabet. Uh, let's see the next one. We are talking of the Yud. And we come again to the Yud in the place where the upper um, part of the sculpture of Michal Holman, you see his young cousin sitting in the Yud, and you understand the idea of a, a void that is a sound that is a letter, that is, of course, part of language. And all these combinations of sounds create together the, the millions and milliards of texts that you can find in the library, in your own life. Whatever we see around us are letters uh, uh, created in the same way by uh, blowing an amount of air from our lungs to our mouth. And we will see it in a moment when we look at, when we look at the uh, underground part of, this, of the sculpture. The next one. Now again, we are, <coughs> sorry, we are with the model of uh, the sculpture by Micha Ullmann. And I see the chat, yes, the heart of the identity someone wrote and I think that it is really a brilliant remark, a brilliant comment that I endorse uh, 100%. Uh, now you see the model and you see again the letters in the circle and we could uh, elaborate on the idea of the circle and how the circle is so important as a mystical, but I don't want to waste your time. I'm sure that many of the of you thought about the idea of the circle uh, a lot. Uh, for Micha Ullmann, by the way, the idea of the circle relates especially to the fact that for him, this kind of circle of, uh, uh, is, is uh, uh, a book twinkling around his spine. He's always stays with the idea of the book. And again, what is important to note are the, are the shadows. And when you look at the next one, you see the shadows on the model starting in the morning when really the day begins. And the next one, and that's noon when all the, sh the shadows are the sh so shortest during the day. And uh, you see, you could see uh, some uh, figures here, figures of spectators or visitors cut. And you could see two things. One, that the, maybe, maybe come back to the, to the former one.
Can you the Deus? Yeah, you see uh, here in their figures, and you see how the visitor itself, himself, human being, is part of these changes of shadows, part of the creation of the language in the sculpture itself. Okay, let's continue. And that's, yeah, that's towards evening. And what is important to note is that the, uh, the shadows go, uh, or the letters, or the shadows of the letters go during the day, during from morning to the evening from west, from east to west. Uh, that is to say, the sculpture of Micha Ullmann and the idea of language, or the language itself it, it conveys, it conveys and it describes is really a language connected immediately with the cosmos, with the astronomy, with something much larger than just a group of letters. And I think that Micha uh, will, will um, elaborate on that when he will talk. And here you see uh, Micha's own uh, shadow. Uh, he's, he holds in his hand the, the photograph, the, um, a photograph and, and uh, a camera. And uh, you see how the visitor or the, or the body of the human being becomes in a way part of the language. And think that when you go in the library, when you go between the shelves of the library, you go between letters, between words that are written in the books around you. You are living, you are walking, you are, you are breathing with many letters around you. And that's what happens also in the sculpture of Micha Ulman. And the next one, please. Now, now we are going to visit the lower part of the sculpture. And you see that the circle of Letters is the upper part, and then there is an entrance. You go, uh, you make a small detour, and you can enter down there through an opening. What will you see when you enter the opening? Let's do it, Stadios. Yeah, that's. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I mean, the sculpture is in the making, so I don't have very neat and beautiful uh, photographs. But you, you, you should understand the concept. What is important is really to to. This whole sculpture is about the concept. So you enter in a kind of a corridor, you see a glimpse of a letter reflected on the wall uh, down there. But let's see the next one. And it's a photograph where you see the corridor from near. You entered now the sculpture. You left the outside and you entered in and you see in the corridor, in the sort of concrete canal or stone canal, a few letters cut in the walls. The easiest is the ein. You see the ein on your right. You could see the chet over there. Uh, I have here, by the way, I'm the uh, deus. I I I notice the questions. So I know that you are going to leave. Time for questions at the end, but I cannot resist the chats. And yes, uh, Michael Mann thought about Feel free. It, but he will, he, will, uh, he will mention it himself. So uh, a circle is always a mystical form that uh, conveys the idea of beginning and end uh, mingled together in a way. Yes, Stone, Stone Age was a kind of very, very far inspiration. He thought about it maybe um, unconsciously, but it wasn't, it wasn't a clear reference from the beginning. Anyhow, coming back to the tunnel that you see here, uh, you have the letter I, I, everything is cut in concrete and stone. You see the Ein, you see the Chet over there at the far end of the left wall of the, of the tunnel. And you see the hay in the ceiling. 
and you notice that these are the guttural, the guttural letters, the letters you pronounce with your with your throat. So uh, we are in a throat now. We are walking the throat, and in a moment we will arrive arrive to the the mouth. And I just well, don't want to forget, but when Micha Ullman speaks of the mouth, the mouth, the human mouth, he says that it's the most beautiful and the most interesting sculpture in the world. Uh, let's continue. And you get to the mouth. Another one, Tadesh? Yeah, yeah. It, and again, we are, we are moving from models to reality. That's a model. You see the... Uh, three letters cut in the ceiling. I think that I mentioned they, they are covered with glass, which fully uh, remind us Berlin. You can stand on the A and you can stand on the Aleph and you can stand on the Aleph and look down. And what happens in the big mouth there is, is a wonderful, and we can already see it, those who dare enter the sculpture, uh, you should have you should, you should wear helmets of course you can't go right like the, from the street it's forbidden it's still a construction site but but the the, the feeling is i mean the, the experience is is unbelievable and you see that on the left wall on the ceiling of the left on the on the place where the ceiling meets meets the the wall you see the beginning of an interesting visual story. Let's see the next one. You see the continuation of it. The, uh, the letters or the, it's not the shadow, the light of the letter, the forms of the letters created by the sun penetrating the opening in the sky begin slowly, slowly to dance in the in in the in the space on the walls it's a wonderful movie to look at it changes quite slowly because during the day uh, it's not it's not very rapid but but you can stay there and and sense and experience have the experience during a whole day from morning to evening uh, let's see father another day another time, another season, and the place, and, and you see this dance, this, this spectacle of, of letters running on the walls of this, we should say mouth, is really spectacular. It's a music. Uh, continue, let's continue. And you see the shadow of the visitor in the, on the wall. And I, I believe that some visitors will be there in the space and will participate in this dance of shadows and lights. And that's why I remember always that the work is called, the name, the title of the work is Letters of Light. And you very well understand, understand why. One more. Just these are glimpses into the the word spectacle, the, 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 the letter spectacle, the letters dance on the walls. And one more, that's noon. In the autumn and in the spring, noon time. And you understand that the sculpture work in the, lower part and also in the circle that we have seen before is after all a sundial. It works with the sun, it's a sundial, big, a huge sundial. And in that way, uh, Michael Orman connects to, to, to ancient civilization who did these kind of immense sundials, which are an experience of a, a formal material, physical experience of the, of the cosmos and the changes in the cosmos. One more, please. That's the noon at the shortest day of the year. What is important is this, since this is a kind of astronomical, astronomical machine, uh, the longest day, the shortest day 
are days in which the spectacle or the, the, the organization of form, forms is special. It's not, they are not, uh, they are calculated. And Michael Mann worked with an astro astronomer in order to, to, to put everything on place in that sense. One more. That's the longest day of the year in the sub, in, at noon. And one more. And that's the real thing. I mean, uh, still it's not clean yet. And you see, uh, you see that it's a construction site, but you see that it works. I mean, we were there many, many times and uh, it's amazing to see how when Michael Mann wants it, the A, the alpha touches the floor or the Aleph touches the floor. Everything is calculated and works as a wonderful magic machine. Uh, one more. And we come back to the model and you see how uh, the, the whole system fades away to the right. And you can really uh, live and feel with your body the, the, the breath of the cosmos in a way. You go one more. You see Michael and himself in the uh, real place. And can you, you can imagine when the walls will be completely whitewashed and uh, uh, the ceiling will be finished with the glass. Uh, it will be superb, it will be perfect. Uh, one more. How it begins to disappear. And you should at night, because for, for um, security reasons, it will be, the site will be closed. But I was privileged to look at it with the moonlight and it's a different, very, very, very nice atmosphere to see all these kind of letters, but uh, almost faded. And uh, it's a completely different atmosphere, but we, the library didn't, couldn't uh, rightly so leave it open at night because it's an open place, open space. Uh, all the citizens of Jerusalem can walk there day and night. One of the most important features of this national library that it, it doesn't has a, have a fence. All the other Jerusalemite institutions like the Israel Museum, for example, or the Knesset have fences. The national uh, library is open to everybody, uh, at least the campus uh, day and night. Let's continue. And this is my last, last slide and what I want to remind you come back to the idea of how Micha Ullman was invited to build in Jerusalem a response, a Jerusalemite response, a living response made of real, real light and warm sunlight and changing features as a response from Jerusalem to the, I would say even to the death of the, Jew, of the Berlin monument, to the void, to the eternal neon light that li lights that lights the the sculpture day and night, uh, you can you can you can. Uh, I, I will ask in a moment Micha to elaborate more on that and to speak about the to do a kind of comparison between Berlin and Jerusalem, and but before that I would like to. Uh, present another question to Micha. And uh, you saw, everybody saw that I mentioned this connection between um, the abstract language and the, and the human body, the mouth, the lungs, the breath, the blowing of, of air in the, in the body, the cosmos, the, the the, the sun, the change of light and shadow because of the sun. And uh, I would like to Micha to ponder on that, on that issue. 
and connected to another book that I didn't mention, but he will, uh, the, what we call in Hebrew, the Sefer Yitzira, a mystical old Kabbalistic uh, book written probably in the ninth century in the Middle Ages. Uh, but um, uh, that was one of the inspirations for Micha Ullmann's work and you will explain, explain I, I, I hope, why. So the floor is yours, Micha. So shall I? Yeah. Okay, good evening. Uh, this work of art, Letters of Light, it's based on 22 uh, letters, uh, which are actually the library is built from these 22 letters. All, all the library is in this work. And uh, the inspiration, as Igor said, was uh, Sefer Yetzira, the book of uh, creation, which uh, tells us about the creation of the world with 22 letters. And uh, this idea, actually, it's uh, for me, it has to do with the nature as well. It's a meeting point between the language and nature. And we know in chemics about 118, I think, elements who built the whole world or the genetics, the life world or the plants, all our climate, it's based on this genius, I would say, system of very few elements that with them you can speak and later write. And it gave the human culture a huge push uh, forward, uh, I think. Uh, I would like to... Uh, read one sentence from uh, Yetzira book. 22 foundation letters are engraved by the voice, carved by the breath, fixed in the mouth in five places, the throat, the palate, the tongue, the teeth, and the lips. So these 22 letters are actually signs, signs uh, of sound that the voice that every mouth can produce in every language. And this combination, which was, by the way, the invention, genius invention, I would say, uh, uh, well, how what, 3,000 years, 500, the invention of the alphabet, which is based on this very simple principle of giving uh, signs, visual signs to the voice. And it comes from speaking. And Egal said as well about uh, the wonderful uh, sculpture, I think the best whatever in my eyes, what happens in the mouth in every language. And it just air. And in my case, it's air, light, and uh, shadow. And the shadows are actually sort of a calligraphy. We saw the pictures before, a calligraphy of shadow on the place, which changes along daytime, according to the season, according to the natural life 
litmus, uh, which we know, and the spectator himself, we saw it before, is actually part of the sculpture with his own shadow. It's possible to go through the letter, the empty letters, you can go through and you discover that uh, your shadow and yourself is part of this culture and you can write so to say uh, what text whatever uh, in this case in Hebrew letters but also with all other languages which come out the same origin the three languages which we mentioned it's the <clears throat> latin script the arabic script and the hebrew script come from the same origin at the same time of the invention and then it's split by the principle stays till today and if you try to compare in English, the English letters to Hebrew letters about 70% about will be the same sound. Same in Arabic and a little bit different uh, order. So the voices which are produ produced, for me actually this work is a work of voice voices this is leading the whole procedures which are quite complex but you see the voices of course the very famous saying from the old uh, testament so the main thing at the end it's a work about speaking and the creation, the endless possibility, potential element to express actually uh, everything. Maybe we could go to the library in Berlin to see the. I, I would like, Michael, I would, I would like only to add one thing that I think it's important to, to note. And that the fact that you are dealing with the letter A, you insist on the letter A, and the letter A is, of course, the beginning of everything. But the letter A is also the, you, you mentioned it, you told me, is the, the, the cry of the newborn. So the idea of beginning is, comes also from there. And in that sense, the big large space at the end of the corridor we have seen before is not only the mouth, it's also the womb. And we are talking of the birth of a language. The concept of birth is very important, I think, to this uh, yeah. sculpture. That's, that's sorry, to, sorry to disturb you. And let's go to the second question. Yeah, it's possible to see uh, the round <coughs> womb, uh, the mouth yeah, producing the letter from the guttural throat, deep sounds going out around uh, the circle, but it's possible to see it as well as the giving birth, pregnancy, and how the letters uh, were born actually every day in you. So you can see it from more than one side. All the elements, by the way. And in the middle, we have this one basic sound, the R. Ah, and uh, there is a reason why it's the first uh, letter, because it's a completely open throat 
which means the first, as you said, the first cry of a baby or when something bad happens to us, uh, our cry will need the whole opening to produce its sound or voice. But if we go from here to Berlin, to Babelplatz, in this case, it's about sound. You see the voice. In Berlin, it's a silence. That's the best basic material over there. So we can go maybe to the second question about Berlin. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think uh, in Berlin, it's uh, the similar um, forms, I would say. It's a void, it's a mystic, <clears throat> what was there and is no more there. It's in relation to the burning of the books. It's about the past, what happened, the books that were burned with the smoke, which we saw in the clouds in the pit, deep in the uh, in in the earth. So it's uh, about, I would say, in short, the burning of the language or the death, what happened a few years, as we know, after the burning, burning of the books was the burning of people. Not too many years, exactly according to this citat, which is in the place in Berlin, nearby the world, in the place where books will be burned, people will be burned later. Uh, like a sort of, uh, like a prophet, yeah, uh, 1820. Uh, so in this case, the empty space, it's, let's say, about what was, and in Jerusalem, it's the same elements, Instead of books, we have here letters, very close, the same, I mean, library. But in this case, this 22 or a little bit more uh, building elements, with them you can pronounce, express everything. So basically, it's the beginning, of course, with the Aleph in the middle, the beginning of endless potential of expressing everything actually in every language with similar style, let's say. It's my uh, working tools, but the letters, they go forward to the future and maybe what could be, or maybe if we want what we want or what we even pray. If you stand in the middle of the room, we saw it in one of the pictures, and you look upwards, in Berlin, you look downwards. You see smoke. When you stand in the middle of this underground room and you look upwards, you see sky, the same sky from for these three letters, and the same sound. It's the common element between these, we can say, even tensions sometimes 
So what could be if to make it short, if we speak to each other, I would say in Hebrew, uh, the word for culture is tarbut. Tarbut means many. The whole culture means how can you do something which is more than one person? How can you communicate to others besides of you? That's a basic idea, let's say. You see it in the Hebrew name for uh, culture. And uh, maybe as an evidence, uh, how it, how much it means, we see in Berlin, these people like Goebbels or students, university, unbelievable, uh, with such uh, ideas that they found the greatest enemy, whatever, is the book. They say intellectual, I say the culture. And maybe Jewish people in the ancient tradition wrote several things about sculpture and they wrote it in stone. So I think it's not such a simple work in Berlin, in Jerusalem. I would say it's more for me a symphony, which has many layers. And I will be happy, most happy, if somebody will find more layers than what I was thinking about. Maybe if there are questions. Um, the, thank you very much, Micha. And yes, as Egal mentioned, there was this question about Stone Age. Whenever there was any influence by the Stone Age. Yes, I think uh, when you come to the place, uh, people, and I have some experience, is that it exists already almost a year in Jerusalem. The building process uh, takes time. Uh, people doesn't understand anything, but it looks interesting. And then they start to discover, like an archaeological site, one step by another. Yeah, I think the Stone Age, five thousand years about. There are so many books, pictures, and so famous, and at the end, nobody is completely sure what is it about. Could be the sun clock watch, maybe no proof, and I like very much this quality that. Uh, we don't know everything, and the beginning starts with hints, with there are here proposals. I discover this, I discover that uh, step by step in Berlin, I think, which is more minimalistic maybe, but not less, I think, uh, in Jerusalem and the correspondence between uh, both of them. So I like very much this mystery and the signals that you can, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. And I would put here maybe a very strange uh, connection uh, from Stone Age to my parents, that uh, my two parents, 
that father and mother came from Germany, 33, few months after the burning of the books. So they un understood this signal in time. So I think the Stone Age, such a mysterious uh, place, and it gathered so much energy, and it became so famous. So because it moves something by people, even if they don't understand exactly what is it about, at least we are not sure. I like it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all. There were there are also a lot of comments, really beautiful comments about both your work, Micha, in Berlin and um, in Jerusalem, as well as about your presentation, Igal. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much, Micha. Thank you very much, Igal. It was really and thank wonderful. you, Tadeusz, for introducing us and organizing the whole thing. With great pleasure, with great pleasure. Thank you very much.